All right, good morning, everybody. It is time for uh, our next lecture. We're going to introduce to you now uh, the basics of electric circuits. So the idea here is that um, we've been studying all of these features of charges and electricity up to this point, and we've really motivated that the discussion of this fundamental property, you know, this idea of charge uh, and electric fields being analogous to mass and gravitational fields, means that uh, there must be some sort of way that we can, in a sense, force these charges to move around and transfer their energy to other things as they do so. This is the basics of the construction of electric circuits. It's the transfer of electric energy from one form to another, like from a battery uh, into a light bulb or whatever other element uh, that you want to put within a circuit. So as usual, we're going to start off today with a brief review of the studio we just finished. This is the electric potential in our electrocardiography studio. We're going to mosey into the basics of circuits. We're going to introduce current and resistance today. And in electric circuits too, we're going to introduce the concepts of um, uh, the voltage, the electric potential, and how all three of these things are related together uh, in a beautiful expression known as Ohm's law. All right, now, if we were meeting in person, uh, we would have you do this little experiment here where we would provide you a battery, a single piece of wire, and a light bulb. So what I'd like you to do right now is go ahead and pause this video really quick and just think to yourself a little bit, how would I arrange all of these pieces to make the bulb light up? All right, pause the video and think about this for a minute. Resume when you're ready. So I hope you thought of a couple different arrangements um, for how to get this light bulb to light. And we'll come back to this here uh, in just a little bit. But before we do, a review question from the studio that we just finished. So here I'm giving you uh, the location, the current location of the heart's dipole moment. And I'm giving you the location of the voltmeter leads that we are going to place to measure this dipole moment. What will the voltmeter read? Positive, negative, or zero? As before, Pause this video, open the grade scope assignment, think on this question for a little bit, give us your answer, and resume the video when you're ready. All right, so easy way to remember this is um, because the electric dipole moment, for our perspective anyway, from the physics perspective, the electric dipole moment points opposite to the direction of the electric field, which means the electric dipole moment is always going to be pointing towards regions of high values, large values, large positive values of the electric potential. Since that's the case, this means that whatever lead the dipole moment is pointing towards is what the voltmeter is going to read. So in this case, the dipole moment is pointing more towards the negative lead. So that means that this will read negative as a result. And as a reminder, the dipole moment points opposite to the electric field, which means it's pointing towards regions of high values of the electric potential. So it essentially, uh, the ECG here is taking a small value and subtracting a large value, which is going to give you a negative number as a result. Okay, so back to this light bulb arrangement here. You don't need to worry about answering this question. Uh, we just wanted to again to get you to think of what different possible ways could you do to light the light bulb. And I hope you thought of a couple of these um, where these arrangements here all work. And notice with these working arrangements that I'm touching both the bottom of the bulb and the side of the bulb. Both of those pieces uh, are in play with this circuit. These arrangements that don't work are either only touching one piece of the bulb or, as you notice in this bottom configuration here, um, they're not making loops. Right? Notice within all of the arrangements that I can always make a loop. I can always start at one point. I can move through the elements and return to that point. All right, uh, Passing through every element only once. I can't do the same thing here with these loops. Uh, this one here is not getting the bottom end of the battery. This one here is not touching the side of the bulb. And this one here isn't even making a loop. It's not touching this, the negative end of the battery or the side uh, of the light bulb as well. So from this, I want you to notice a couple of things. That to get these light bulbs to light, to get electric energy to be transferred from the battery to the light bulb, um, both pieces of the light bulb need to be in contact, the bottom of this uh, and the side. And more importantly, you need to be forming loops. 
you have to have that all the elements that you want as part of your circuit uh, have to be present uh, and participating within the circuit and you have to have loops that are formed such that you can pass through every element and return to where you started. This is gonna be really important for us as we go through our discussion of circuits today. So again, no need to answer this one on grade scope. We sort of talked about it a little bit. Um, given that both um, the bottom and the side of the light bulb need to participate uh, in order for the light bulb to light, this means that both the side and the bottom need to participate in the formation of one of these loops. So if you look inside uh, a light bulb that has one of these little filaments that is converting uh, the current that is passing through it, presenting some resistance and converting it into heat, which is producing this light, um, are only able to form a loop if you include the side and the bottom. All right. I want to make this very, very clear. I want to hit this even more because this is, in a sense, the biggest element of this circuit creation that we need for today. And you noticed that in all of those configurations that worked, I could always sort of follow this path, this circular path to get from one element to the next and then return to where I started. When I have all of these connected, in a singular loop, I am able to get electric energy transferred from the battery to the light bulb. And again, it's because I am creating this loop-like path, a positive terminal through the light bulb, through the wire, back to the negative end of the battery, back to the positive end of the battery, and so on and so forth, and it loops and loops and loops and loops. And I know I keep harping on this, but it's such an important point is that when this electric energy is transferred from the source of energy within a circuit, which could be a battery, which could be a power supply of some kind. Um, it has to touch every element that you want to transfer energy to, and you have to give it a loop for it to flow through, a loop for it to move around as it does so. This then is our first uh, definition for the day, is how is this electric energy getting from the battery to the various elements within the loops? Well, of course, it's the charges that are flowing through this battery, through the light bulb, through the wires that are carrying the energy from the battery to the rest of the circuit. Since that's the case, this is going to be our first definition for circuitry, is we're going to look at a particular point within a circuit, and I'm going to count all of the charges that pass through that point in some given time. The amount of charge that passes through some given point in a circuit in a given time interval will define for me what we will call the current within a circuit. So current is simply the amount of charge that moves through some location in some given time. If charge is measured in coulombs and the timing is measured in seconds, this means that your current is going to be in units of coulombs per second. This is defined as the ampere, or we usually shorten it just to say that the current is measured in some certain value of amps. And be aware that uh, one amp of current is a fairly large amount of current, all right? Because one coulomb of charge, remember, the elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So one coulomb of charge means you have on, on the order of like 10 to the 18, 10 to the 19 charges that are moving through some small little area in some given time. So one amp of current is a fairly hefty amount of current. Um, more what we'll find when we're working through our studio exercises and our homeworks that we're gonna be dealing with more in kind of the milliamp, microamp kind of range. All right, now what we'll find is it's gonna be helpful for us to adopt um, some common symbols to indicate the types of things that are gonna be present within these circuits. Because I don't wanna to have to go through, you know, every time that I'm drawing a new circuit, and I don't wanna to have to, you know, I, I'm a terrible artist, so I don't wanna to have to draw this battery, and I don't wanna to have to draw this really complicated looking bulb. So what we're gonna do instead is we'll come up with a couple of conventions that all of us will use to indicate that there are elements present and connected in a certain way within a circuit. So to indicate that there is a battery present, we'll use two horizontal lines with one of them longer than the other. The longer side of the battery is going to indicate um, that that is the battery's positive terminal. All right. With the bulb, we'll simply do a circle, but we'll put a filament 
inside to indicate it's a bowl. We'll have a couple of other circuit elements that are going to appear as circles, but they'll indicate um, a letter within them to distinguish that they're different here from the light bulb. Um, and for any sort of just connection between elements for like a wire, for instance, we're just gonna use a straight line. All right, now be aware as we go through and we create some of these uh, circuits that are using these symbols uh, to indicate the connection between them, that the um, electrical connections between the circuits that we draw and the actual physical circuits with the batteries and bulbs will be the same, but your sort of symbolically drawn circuit may not look the same as what you will see in an actual physical layout. So for instance, coming up here, you'll see uh, some of these symbolically drawn circuits that have like these 90 degree bends in them, for instance, just to make them easier to draw. You'll never see that in a wire. You know, all the wires are gonna be straight or curving lines, for instance. But be aware what matters here when we draw this out symbolically is that the connections are correct. And by connections, I mean that things are uh, represented as being in series or parallel correctly. And again, we'll develop those terms a little bit later in this lecture. So here's an example of what I'm talking about here. Um, here would be a physical layout of uh, something that you would build, for instance, in studio. And here's its corresponding circuit diagram. Notice here that the electrical connection is exactly the same. I start at the battery, I move through the bulb, and I go back to the negative end of the battery. The circuit diagram is exactly the same connection. I start at the battery, I move through the bulb, and I go back to the negative end of the battery. All right, and again, it's just so much easier for us to quickly draw and represent the electrical connections with the circuit diagram, as opposed to having to draw out the battery and the light bulb holder and everything else sort of in the um, explicit physical layout. So moving forward, we're going to be using these circuit diagrams, again, on the understanding that they show us the same electrical connections that the physical layouts do. All right, now, as we go through our circuitry analysis, just like we did for fluids, uh, we are gonna have to make a couple of assumptions uh, to make our understanding of these systems a little bit more straightforward to handle. Um, and here's a couple of the ones that we are going to be doing here. First of all, um, if you have a loop within a circuit. As long as you've created a loop, you will have a flow of charge, which again we define uh, as a current that is moving from one terminal of the battery through the rest of the circuit and then back uh, into the negative terminal of the battery. So anytime that you form these complete loops within circuits, we will have current that is flowing through them. All right, and our second assumption here is a bit of the bigger one. We'll need this uh, uh, as we go through our discussion today uh, and in the next lecture. Um, if the bulbs are identical, and by identical we mean uh, that these bulbs carry the same resistance, um, and all the bulbs that you will be working with in studio for the most part are going to be identical, they will have the same resistance. If they are identical, the brighter that a bulb is, the more current is therefore passing through it. All right, so this is gonna be our next big assumption is that the brightness is an indicator of the amount of current that is passing through a bulb. The more current that passes through, the more charges per second, in a sense, are present to exchange energy with the bulb and the brighter the bulb is going to become as a result. So keep these two assumptions in mind as we go through the rest of today's lecture and your next lecture as we introduce the concept of the uh, voltage and Ohm's law. Okay, so I mentioned previously that, again, generally speaking, there are really only two ways that we can connect elements in a circuit with respect to each other. Here's the first one. If I connect two elements along the same line, we, excuse me, we say that those elements are connected in series with respect to each other. So this means, in a sense, that there is no break in the circuit from one element to the other. There's no choice that the current is given as it passes from one element to the next. All of the current that passes through this first bulb has to pass through the second one. We're not giving the current any opportunity to take any other path. It is forced to pass through both of these bulbs. If that is the case, if this is the particular arrangement that we find these elements in, we say that these elements are connected in series with respect to each other. All right, with that in mind, 
Here's our first big question of the day. Here's a couple different circuits, one with just one bulb and one with two bulbs. Take a minute or so, read through this question and rank for me the brightness of the bulbs. Remember, brightness of a bulb is indicative of how much current is passing through it. Pause this video, give us your answer on Gradescope, and return to the video when you're ready. <clears throat> All right, so brightest to dimmest in this case. And you can really think of this, let me see if I give the answer, I do, yeah. And you can really think of this as um, the current, the charges that are flowing through these elements is the same as fluids that are moving through a pipe. And you can think of it like, if, if I have fluid that is flowing around these two pipes, for instance, and this pipe has one obstruction, but this pipe has two obstructions, that the fluid is forced to interact with, then which of the fluid flows is going to be slower? Well, the fluid is going to be flowing slower through the pipe that has two obstructions as opposed to one. Now, remember, the flow of the current through a bulb is indicative of its brightness. So if this flow has more obstructions, it's going to be moving slower. If it's moving slower through the bulbs, it is going to be dimmer as a result. So this means that bulbs B and C are going to be the same brightness and they will be dimmer than bulb A because if you like, the current flow through the first circuit is significantly bigger than it is for the second circuit. Since the second circuit is presenting more obstructions, there are more ways for the current to be able to present its energy. Now, here's the trickier piece. All right, I claim to hear that bulbs B and C will be the same brightness, which means they must have the same flow moving through them. All right, don't fall into the trap that thinking that current is used up as it passes through an element. All right, don't, don't fall into the trap of thinking um, charge, a charge moves into a bulb, it transfers all of its energy to the bulb, and then it's done doing what it does. All right, remember the first assumption that we made moving into the circuitry argument. Um, as long as we give a loop for current to flow, it is going to continuously flow around that entire loop. In this case, we cannot have, for a single loop like this, we cannot have that the current flow speed is different. I can't have that it's flowing, say, you know, uh, 10 meters per second through B and 5 meters per second through B. All right, that would violate our continuity assumption that we, uh, was very, very uh, important for us when we were talking about fluids. So I must have that if there are two obstructions in a pipe like this, the fluid flow is the same through those two obstructions. Here, the current flow is the same through bulbs B and C, therefore they are the same brightness. All right, but because there are more obstructions in the second circuit as compared to the first, there will be less overall current flow in the second circuit as compared to the first. Therefore, bulb A will be brighter. All right, let's try to hone that in a little bit more. Let me ask you a couple more questions about these circuits. First of all, how does the current in battery one compare to that through bulb A? So I'm talking about battery one and bulb A. All right, and remember our first assumption, around a single loop, the current flow is the same. Current is not used up. The flow does not change when it experiences obstructions. The flow speed is the same around any single loop. So this means that the current through battery one is the same as the current through bulb A. Now, how does the current through bulb B compare to bulb C? We've answered this already. There are more obstructions present, so the current flow in the second circuit is, short, is uh, slower than the first circuit. But remember, current is not used up as it passes through an element. All elements in the same series connection will have the same current flowing through them. So this means that the current through bulb C is the same as the current through bulb C. All right, but we argued that the second circuit here has more obstructions. There are more things for the flow to interact with as it moves through those paths. So this means that the current through bulbs B and C will be less 
than the current that is flowing through A. Because again, B and C have more obstructions for the current. So the entire flow through circuit two will be less than the flow through circuit one. All right, but all of B, C, and two are in the same loop. And this is our first assumption that everything in the same loop receives the same current. So the current through B is the same as the current through C, which is the same as the current that goes through the battery number two. But again, this entire current flow through the second circuit will be smaller than the entire current flow through the first circuit. All right, let's specify this a little bit more. I've been referring to these bulbs as obstructions. More specifically, we refer to them as presenting resistance to the current flow. The more bulbs that are present, the more obstructions they present to the circuit. Therefore, the larger amount of resistance to the current flow that they will present to the entire circuit. So the more bulbs I add in series, the more obstructions the current has to pass through. Therefore, the more resistance the circuit is presenting to the current flow. The larger the resistance is, the smaller the current becomes, even though, again, remember that for elements in series, current is not used up. The same amount of current passes through every element that is wired in series. All right, that's exactly what I said here. All right, that was our first case, which are two elements that are wired in series. The second case is we are now going to give current a choice. We are going to add what we're going to refer to as a junction right here. So now watch what current can do. Current is going to leave the battery, can hit this kink, and it's going to pass into this junction. Now current is allowed to make a choice. It is either going to go down, vertically down through this segment and pass through the battery, or it is going to go to the right, pass through the second bulb, and then go back to the battery. All right. Anytime current is given a choice of paths that it can take, we say that those paths are presenting parallel branches to the circuit. And this works vice versa as well. Anytime that we say something is wired in parallel, this means that we are adding a junction into the circuit. We are giving current a choice as to which particular path it is going to take. When current is given a choice, we say that these are wired in parallel with respect to each other. So let's ask the same kind of question here. This is a little bit trickier. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you the question here, and then we'll talk about um, the answer, which may seem a little bit odd, but I wanna see what you think sort of uh, a priori. So here's the same question as before. Here I have a new circuit now with battery three, and I have bulbs A, D, and E. Do the same thing as before. Please rank the brightnesses of these bulbs. Take a second, pause the video, give us your answer on great scope, return when you're ready. All right, so here, this is a little bit odd, but you can think about it this way, and we will develop this under the concept of resistance here in just a little bit. Think about this from the perspective of one of these electrons that is flowing around this circuit, all right? For circuit one, I have an electron that leaves the battery, passes through bulb A, and returns to the battery. So from that electron's perspective, it is a one battery, one bulb circuit, okay? So now we have an electron that leaves battery three, it hits the junction and it must make a choice, all right? We're not going to admit any quantum mechanical can take both paths simultaneously shenanigans here, all right? It must pick which of the two paths it is going to take. Um, and I'm anthropomorphizing, of course, but um, just bear with me. So this electron could pick and it could say, all right, I'm gonna travel down, go through bulb D and return to the battery. So from the perspective of that electron, it is a one bulb, one battery circuit, because that electron that travels down path D never experiences the fact that bulb E is present. And that also works vice versa. I will have a, an electron that leaves uh, battery three, travels, hits this junction, chooses to go through E, and then back to the battery. 
So from the perspective of that second electron, it again is a one battery, one bulb circuit, because that electron that experiences bulb E will never pass through bulb D. So from all these electrons' perspectives, from all the three possibilities of the path that they can travel, each electron is experiencing a one bulb, one battery circuit. So from the perspective of each of those electrons, the resistance is the same, hence the current should be the same, and we arrive at the rather strange result that all of these bulbs will therefore be the same brightness. Right? But you're going to fight me on this, and that is okay, because you're going to say, well, wait a minute, Dr. Young, um, uh, only like half uh, of the total amount of current is passing through E because it has to split at that junction, so shouldn't they each be half as bright uh, as they did before? All right, and I hear you. Let's answer some of these questions. Let me help you uh, move through this a little bit. Now, first of all, again, we are assuming here that we have ideal batteries, ideal bulbs. This is a perfectly fine assumption for all the problems that you're gonna solve in this course, but do be aware, of course, that um, real batteries that you will use do carry a little bit of internal resistance. Um, the bulbs' resistance can vary as well with their age, the filaments begin to wear out uh, a little bit as well, and so on and so forth. But again, as we go through this discussion, we will assume ideality in all of our batteries and our bulbs. So let's go through the, the, the same sort of uh, discussion that we've done before. Let's answer all these questions and understand what's happening to the resistance of these circuits. So how does the current through battery one compare to that through bulb A? We remember our first assumption, which is one and A are part of the same loop. There's no junction. Uh, so battery one and bulb A are in series, which means the current that passes through them must be the same. All right. How does the current that passes through bulb D compare to the current that passes through bulb E? Well, once again, we can do this sort of electron perspective kind of thing. I have one electron that is gonna to choose to pass through D and go back to the battery. I'll have one electron that chooses to go through E and will also go back to the battery as well. This means that the current that passes through D is going to be the same as the current that passes through E. In a sense, if you like, um, both paths D and E are presenting the same resistance to an electron that is making a choice at that junction. So the electron really has no preference for one path or the other. It's just kind of saying, well, you know, the resistance is the same, so I suppose I'll just, you know, randomly choose um, either path. And I apologize, of course, as I'm giving uh, this pre-recorded lecture, my apartment complex decides that it's going to be doing uh, groundwork right outside my front door. So I'm sorry uh, if you're hearing some of that. All right. How does the current through D or E compared to bulb A? Again, we motivated this. The idea that from the perspective of a single electron, all of these paths are equivalent. All the paths that these electrons can take are essentially one bulb, one battery paths. So the current through D is the same as the current through E, which is the same as the current through A. This therefore implies something a little bit strange because we have this junction here, all right? And what's really going on uh, with these junctions? So let's just say here, let's follow this path of, the, of, of current, all right? Current leaves the positive end of the battery and hits this junction. Now current has a choice. It's going to split. Some of it is gonna go down path E, some of it is going to go down path D. But now, at this junction on the other side, on the back side of the circuit, I have current that is coming in through D, I have current that is coming in through E. Just like fluids, when they meet up, when I have two pipes that are coming in and meeting up at some point, their flows add to make a total flow, it's the exact same thing here. I have current that is passing through D coming into this junction, I have current passing through E that is coming into this junction. So at this junction, the total values of the currents will add. So what this means is, let's put some numbers behind this, all right? Let's say I have one amp of current that is passing through A and is therefore passing through battery one. We motivated here that if one amp of current flows through A, one amp of current is also going to flow through D. If one amp of current flows through D, this means one amp of current flows through E. This means that 
one amp meets up at the junction with another one amp that meets up at the junction. This means that battery three is carrying and pushing out two amps into the circuit. All right, this is a really important point. The same battery can supply different amounts of current to a circuit depending on the resistance of the circuit that is presented to that battery. All right, when we get to the next lecture and we talk a little bit more about voltage uh, and Ohm's law, we will present to the idea that in a sense, the battery is always supplying the same push into the circuit. That push meets up with the resistance of the circuit that is presented to it and then supplies the circuit with some current. All right, so the same voltage battery can supply different currents to a circuit. And that's what we're seeing here. Battery one is supplying one amp to the circuit. Battery three is supplying two amps to the circuit. One amp is going down branch D and one amp is going down branch E. All right. This then means, and I've sort of already answered this for you, so you don't need to answer this on grade scope. Uh, this means then that the current that is passing through battery one is less than the current that is passing through battery three. All right, and again, think of it this way, right? So what have I done here? Adding a parallel branch increases the current that is passing through the circuit. Let me give you a physical analogy, all right? Current again is just flow. All right, it is just the passage of some element of something in some given time. In this case, we're talking about it as a flow of charges. All right, think about it also as like a flow of cars. Let's say we have a toll booth. All right, uh, you're streaming along on the highway and you come up uh, against the toll booth. All right, and that toll booth only has one lane open. What's going to be the flow of traffic through that one lane toll booth? Well, it's going to be pretty slow right? Because the toll booth can only handle one car at a time. So the flow of traffic, hence the flow of the current, will be pretty small. Now what happens if I open up a second toll booth right next door? What's going to happen to the flow of traffic through that toll station? Well, it's going to increase because now that toll station can handle twice as many cars as it did before. Adding parallel branches to a circuit is just like adding extra toll booths to a station. The more choices you give the current, the easier it is for the current to pass from one end of the battery to the other. The more parallel branches I add to a circuit, the larger the current becomes within that circuit. All right. Now, we sort of already implicitly used uh, one of these really important ideas, which is when current meets up at a junction, it will split into various paths and it will then recombine on the back side of those paths at the other junction. This is a statement of one of two what are called Kirchhoff's rules or Kirchhoff's laws for a circuit. The first of which is called Kirchhoff's junction law. And it essentially states exactly what we've set up to this point. The amount of current that comes into a junction must exactly equal the amount of current that leaves some particular junction. And again, you've seen this before. All right, this was our continuity equation for fluids. The amount of fluid flow, the flow rate into some uh, section of pipe must equal the flow out of that section of pipe. It's the same for current. Just like we can't have um, fluid mass building up anywhere, we can't have current building up anywhere. We can't have the charges collecting in one portion of the circuit. So all the current that comes into some particular junction must go out of that particular junction. All right, so what does this mean about these parallel branches? So we motivated here that because there are more paths, the current in a parallel circuit increases. But remember our statement from before, where we said that um, adding elements in series decreases the current, therefore the resistance of that circuit increases by adding series connections. Here we saw that adding parallel connections increases the current within a circuit. So now we have the opposite, sort of opposite statement, which is um, adding elements in series increases the resistance of a circuit. Adding elements in parallel decreases the resistance of the circuit 
that is presented to the battery. And hence, the current in a parallel circuit will increase. Remember, this is the statement that the same battery can put out different amounts of current depending on the resistance presented to the battery. All the battery does is it supplies the push. All right, it supplies the push to the electrons, the circuit presents the resistance to the battery, and then the current flows to the circuit based on the combination of the push and the resistance. And we'll talk more about the push um, in the next lecture. We're gonna end up calling that the voltage of a circuit. All right, now we've been using here uh, light bulbs to sort of indicate that I am adding resistance to some current that is passing through and forcing it to exchange its energy of motion into some other form, usually light or heat uh, of some kind. So just be aware uh, that there are many different types of resistors that we can use. Here are some of the more common ones whose real purpose is just to convert that current flow uh, into heat. It actually heats up uh, this resistor. We'll be using some of these resistors in some later studios and just be aware uh, that these circuits have a very specific uh, symbolic representations. We're going to indicate them uh, with a diagonal line when we're putting in specific resistors as opposed to light bulbs. Uh, you should also be aware that these resistors are color coded. You can tell how big the resistance is by reading off the colors on these resistors. You do not need to know that for 115. There's a whole color matching scheme for telling how much uh, resistance a resistor is presenting, uh, and you do not need to worry about that. All right, we will always give you what the value of the resistance is, but just be aware this is why uh, those colored bands are there. So you can read them off to tell uh, how big this resistor is. All right, now what we'll have you practice a little bit in studio here is typically what we want to do is um, analyzing a circuit with a lot of different resistors in it is fairly challenging in terms of, you know, how is the current gonna split into all the resistors um, as we'll discuss in the next lecture? How is the voltage going to split across all those resistors? All right, so it's helpful for us to create what we refer to as an equivalent circuit, uh, which contains the equivalent resistance. And what this means is, um, so I have a circuit here with one battery and three resistors. If I could change this into a circuit that had one battery and only one resistor, it would be much easier to analyze, right? I'd much rather deal with one resistor as opposed to three. But we have to be very, very careful and ensure that the one resistor equivalent circuit that we build behaves electrically the same as the original three resistor circuit that we started with. So this is how we do it. If I want to take a bunch of resistors that are uh, 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 in series with respect to each other, and I want to replace them with one resistor, which is electrically equivalent to the three of them, it's nice and simple. I just add them together. So if I wanted to combine these three resistors into one, I would simply add all their resistances together. And the equivalent resistance would simply be the sum of all the resistances in series. Parallel is a little bit trickier. If I want to create an uh, equivalent circuit for parallel resistances, so here I have R1, R2, and R3 that are all in parallel. If I want to create a one resistor equivalent circuit that electrically behaves the same as these three in parallel, it's the same kind of sort of addition, but here notice that it is inverses, all right? So one over the equivalent resistance is one over the sum of all the individual resistors that are in parallel. So be really careful here, this is an inverse inverse law. So you have to take the inverse of all the resistances and then take the inverse of your final answer. All right, and note again that this is being created from a parallel arrangement. So this total current that is flowing through the battery will be a combination of each of the currents that are flowing down each of these individual branches. Remember, these are parallel branches, so current will split three ways to go through each of these three paths, and then will recombine to pass through the battery. This was the reason why uh, these parallel uh, circuits had larger current that is passing through the battery, because in a sense you have each of these three uh, distinct individual paths that are adding together to produce a total amount. All right, 
That's all I have for you today. Hopefully that is enough uh, to get you started on the basics of uh, current and resistance within circuits. When we come back uh, to our next lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more on this idea of the push that the battery is providing to the circuit. We're going to refer to this, of course, as the potential that is present, uh, presented to a circuit. And then we will find that there is a beautiful relationship between the current, the resistance, and the push or the potential that the battery is giving to the circuit. And that will allow us to uh, solve all of these circuits in terms of finding those various values for each of the elements that we want to sort of share uh, the electric energy to the circuit that is given by the battery. So thank you very much again for watching. Thank, uh, thank you for your attention today. And uh, I will hopefully see you in a future lecture.